The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Hey everyone, welcome into episode 42 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week I'm continuing my mini series on the local Pittsburgh drummer scene with the great David Throckmorton. David first rose to national recognition as a young drummer in the late 90s, gigging with legendary trumpeter Maynard Ferguson. He's since been firmly rooted here on the Pittsburgh scene, and you can catch him pretty much any night of the week in one of the different venues, playing some really, really creative, interesting, adventurous music with his own bands. He leads a lot of different projects, which we talk about here. And I also am reviving an old topic for this episode, my top 10. Uh, I think David and I share a lot of influences, so I wanted to see how many of them crossed over come from the same like early 90s jazz fusion world so anyway it's a great chat we talk about some gear we definitely talk a lot of our favorite drummers let's get right to it with the great david throckmorton all right i'm gonna fire away actually no i gave you the homework for this episode but before yeah. we get into that <laughs> tell me again why i should have gotten a yamaha maple custom kit instead of my premier signia kit in 1997 <laughs> well um I don't have all that much experience playing Signia kits. You know, okay. I play, I, I've definitely hit a few in my day, and and they're great. Um, so I don't want to dog anybody's stuff. They make nice stuff. Actually, my dad <clears throat> used to be a Premier endorser when I was a kid. Wow, well, no kidding. And so my first kit was a Premier kit. But um, um, I don't know, man. Like, I've been with Yamaha for over 20 years now and I, I love all their stuff their, their hardware is kind of the best to me the tune i find whether i'm tuning up up and down with the same head combinations they just always work man you know and and yeah. i have a bunch of different series of yamaha kits but to me that's the one i gig with the most and there's just like from bebop super high tuning bebop to like rock and roll they just work for everything you know, and they're just so consistent, you know, they're, mm. I don't know what else to say. They're, they're, they're really quite amazing. Like I love Gretsch drums. I have two old Gretsch kits and some, I have an old sonar kit and, and they're amazing too, but the, yeah. And they're easy to find. Like you're going to, if you need to get back line, chances are somebody's probably going to be able to come across a Yamaha kit. Good luck trying to find a Premier Signia kit for back yeah, line. Right. <laughs> no. How did you discover that the six and a half deep snare was the one to get? You know, I would have gotten a five and a half guaranteed. I, I have a five and a half. Um, when, when I played in Maynard Ferguson's band, 98 and 99, there was a Maple Custom kit that kind of stayed on the road with Maynard's band. And there was a five and a half with that kit. The first, I think the first run I did with the band, I brought a snare at the time before I was with Yamaha, I used to endorse these drums called um, Baltimore drums, kind of endorsed, like a, like a low grade endorsement. Then they changed their name to Maryland drums. And now I think they're back to Baltimore drums. And um, I played a snare of theirs out on the road for a while. And I would use that Yamaha snare drum, the five and a half sometimes as a auxiliary snare drum. And after a while, I just thought, this snare drum sounds great. I just, why do I need to bring mine out with me and fly with it? And, or, you know, so I just used it. Um, the six and a half, I got some years later. Um, well, years, I, I, my first Yamaha kit was an absolute kit with absolute snares, um, a six and a half and a five and a half. And those were great. But when I got my Maple Custom kit later down the road, my personal kit, um, I got a six and a half with it. And from as soon as I got it, started playing it, I just kind of, there was just something really special about it. And I kind of stuck with that drum. And um, I have two of those, two six and a halves, um, one set up with wood hoops that I almost never play. And one set up with the traditional um, like die cast hoops that came on, which I think were zinc die cast at the time before they switched to aluminum die cast. But um, if I leave the house with drums 99 times out of a hundred, or a hundred times out of a hundred, I have that six and a half with me, you know, and it just always works, you know, for everything, you know, mm. it's kind of, they're getting, kind of pricey. Like they're getting, they're getting more expensive now too. They're getting, um, 
the resale on those drums is, is crazy. It's through the roof, you know? Yeah, I think I looked, I tried to find one when she told me that a couple of weeks ago, and you can't find a six and a half for less than what I would have paid for a whole kit back in 98 or something. Like it's Say that again, man. I lost you for a second with my internet. Oh, the uh, I've been looking for one of those snares, and, and they're, they're so expensive now. Like I was yeah. originally going to buy a whole kit for about the price that you could find a used six and a half maple custom. It's insane. Yeah, the the, the drums are also hard to find now um, in kind of the sizes that most guys want, like standard size tom toms and floor toms on legs. Mm -hmm. You can find like power tom kits and mounted floor kits, which were like kind of more popular. I think when people were buying those drums when they first came out, so it's hard to find like you know, a 14 by 18 bass drum or a 14 by 20 or a eight by 12 rack tom or a nine by 13, they're, they're kind of hard to, hard to come by, you know? So I'm glad I have them, man. And I don't see any, I, I don't see any reason I can't be playing that kit for the rest of my life or as my kind of go-to kit, you know? What is, your, what is the primary setup you take out? If I'm playing jazz, like straight ahead, more straight ahead type jazz, which where, where my, the bulk of my gigs has kind of leaned that way the last 10 years. Um, usually just a four piece bebop kit, you know, eight by 12, 14 by 14. Sometimes I'll bring a second floor tom, a 16 by 16. And then usually a 14 by 18 inch bass drum with the six and a half snare. Um, there are some groups where I'll play, um, like I have this more experimental beat kind of group, which is the same kit basically with a 14 by 20 inch bass drum. Um, just tuned a little bit lower and maybe I'll have a secondary snare. Um, usually that's like this, um, Elvin Jones snare drum Yamaha, which I put zinc die casts on that took the wood hoops off. And that, that's a great drum as well. It's a seven inch deep drum, but I'll usually use that as like the lower tuned drum and keep the six and a half kind of, you know, medium high range, you know, not cranked ever, but, but never super low either. Do you do any muffling on any of the um, drums? Um, sometimes I'll use a little bit of gaffer tape on on some tom toms to control them. A little more often in um, like singer songwriter kind of gigs or like rock gigs, which I don't do a ton of, but I do some of those. Um, and then sometimes those pieces of tape will just remain on there, and I won't take them off, and I'll still use them like that for for jazz. Um, and then. The bass drum, I'll, I'll do the typical jazz thing where you just kind of put a towel in between the pedal and the and the head, the batter head, if I need it. Um, I never muffle from the inside um, with those for that kind of playing. But if I'm playing like a more groove thing or a fusion thing, um, I'll muffle a bigger bass drum for sure. Like I'll put a pillow on a 22 or, um, you know, a couple towels or something. Like I like that sound for a more traditional kind of, you know, the bass drum sound we all heard growing up on MTV and mm. after, you know, through all the stuff I like fusion music, I grew up loving and stuff, you know, like Weckle and Vinny sound and those and Gad and those guys. So I love that sound still. Um, um, when I play that band with the 20 inch bass drum, sometimes I'll, I'll still leave it kind of open, but I'll, I will port the front head just to get a little air shooting out of the front head. So I can kind of, if I want to bury the beater more, I, I can get a little more of that attack if I, if I want to get that, you know? Um, and usually I'm tuning higher than I grew, kind of grew up playing. I'm tuning a little higher. I'm liking the feeling of the, um, a little more springiness off of the head, specifically the Tom Toms, not crazy high, but, um, definitely not as low as I grew up playing, like, you know, coming out of the Gad, Weckl, Vinny, Dennis Chambers kind of sound, you know, when I was a teenager and whatnot. Are you particular about like the intervals between drums or having the bottom head tighter or any kind of tuning? No, habits? Um, I, I like the bottom head tighter. Normally on the toms, the bottom head's usually a little higher, um, but I don't tune any specific um, pitch. You know, when I see um, like some drum companies <laughs> will suggest pitches with for their drum. I think that's kind of silly. You know, you should be able to tune the drum up and down and it still sound like a drum and still be responsive and have tone. Um, so I just kind of do it by ear. I'm sure like for certain styles, um, if I'm using 
uh, more toms, let's say, and I'm playing jazz. Maybe I'm thinking about um, the sounds of certain drummers I love or grew up listening to, whether it be Elvin or Tony or Jack or or um, Tane or Bill Stewart. And I, those guys tune different, but depending on what the music calls for and what I'm doing, I may um, tune a little higher or a little lower. You know, um, I never use. I mean, it's it's almost always one rack tom. Sometimes I'll play two in a, in a weird situation. I've been trying to find a 13 for that uh, Maple Custom kit. So if I wanted to use two rack toms, I could use that because I kind of I kind of outgrew 10s a long time ago. They just kind of, unless I'm tuning really low, like they, they don't they don't really work for me, you know. Um, but it's a cool sound. I still like hearing guys play them. I just find them, like I'd rather hear, hear a tune, an eight tuned a little lower excuse me, a little higher than a 10 tuned lower, mm. you know, I just like the, 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 the drum sounds a little more round to me and not as, not as punchy, like that 10 kind of sound, you know? Do I recall you using a 16 inch bass drum at some point or am I misremembering? There may have been a few gigs where I used a 16 inch floor Tom from my plum absolute kit early late nineties, early two thousands where I might've did a few gigs just trying that out just to try to see what that was like. I mean, literally maybe I did that five or four or five times. And then I used to have a band called beam, which was kind of a mix of like hip hop and fusion and junk jungle, you know, around the time all these drummers were starting to do that. Like Jojo and Zach and the, Jack Danziger and those guys. And sometimes I would use a second bass drum and use that, 16 as like an auxiliary bass drum, but I haven't done that for 20 years or so, yeah, you know, I'm aging myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. What is your, uh, what is your symbol setup and does it ever change? Yeah, it changes a lot. Um, um, I grew up playing, like I said, like a lot of groove music and kind of my heroes, young drumming heroes were, I mean, there were so many, but like specifically, I love Gad and Weckl and Vinny and Dennis and Will Kennedy, kind of like the, it shows my age, like when, like when I was a teenager and a young teenager to my, to 20, like that was kind of the stuff that was hot at the time. Um, not that the great jazz drummers weren't amazing and hot as well. I was just kind of gravitated towards that um, when I was young. And so if I'm playing anything that resembles that kind of music, um, which I'm not doing as much anymore. Uh, um, I have a deal with Sabian and I'll play their stuff. A lot of stuff from the, um, like crashes from the legacy line or the evolution line. Um, or, um, so usually like a 20 inch evolution, excuse me, I'm wrong. A 20 inch legacy ride. that's really thin kind of as a crash I'll use on the left, sometimes an 18 on the far right. And then a ride, I'll usually use like a, um, like this Artisan 22 prototype that I have that's been kind of over hammered and it, it dried it out a little bit. And then the hats, I'll usually use like um, 14 inch legacy hats for that kind of a setup. Um, and I might add some little bells and whistles around that. But for jazz, when I'm playing most of the time, um, I try to use the Sabian stuff when I can, but I don't have a lot of stuff. That, their stuff is amazing, but I end up using a lot of OKs and old A's and things of that nature. So my primary kind of setup that I play most of the time is um, a, a, an old stamp 22 in the main position, kind of a thinner old K. Um, this Istanbul Agop um, special edition jazz ride on the left and on the far right, I'll use either this older um, Peisty 18-inch 602 flat ride, like the Roy Haynes ride, or I'll use a Zildjian K light flat sometimes. And then sometimes I'm playing a little louder music, like the organ group or um, like a larger group. I'll move that main K, old K, to the far right, and I'll use a slightly heavier old K. Um, not heavy body stretch, but heavier than the, than the other one in the main position. And that's kind of my main setup. And then I have a set of 14 inch um, Sabian prototypes, like an HHX prototype and an HH prototype. They're both tops and I'll use those as, as high hats um, most of the time. Sometimes I'll bring out some old K hats, a set of 14s or a set of 15s. 
Um, well, yeah, I feel like as the older I get and the more jazz I'm playing, the setup gets smaller. And, and a lot of times I'm just playing a four piece kit with two cymbals. And even frequently I'll go out with just a bass drum and a snare drum and a, a cymbal or two. And I feel like that's helped my playing a lot, just trying to um, not have as many options, you know? It's like, you know, if you put a cowbell on your kit or something or whatever, a set of bongos or some something crazy. Not that that's crazy, but you know what I mean? Like, you're going to hit it just because it's there, you know? Mm. So I find sometimes even with toms or extra cymbals, you're going to just play them because it's an option. So I feel like playing um, less stuff has definitely made me, I don't know, just get more out of out of less. And I think it's made me play better in a lot of ways, mm. you know? Is that determined by the type of gig or the location of the gig or just sure. feeling sometimes that? It's, sometimes it's volume related or, or, or how big the room is, or if you know that you're going to be needing to play quiet for the environment of the, of the situation. Sometimes it can be laziness, just like, oh, I don't want to take a bunch of drums. I mean, I'm, I, I've never been too lazy with that stuff. I, I, I uh, cause I'll bring a lot of stuff if I need to. And I, I like it. I still like setting up and, you know, I don't like the schlep so much, but I like setting up gear and getting it sounding good and feeling comfortable. And so, but yeah, it just changes based on the situation, you know, more than anything. And a lot of times I, I like to like, um, and I don't try to do this to make it hard for anybody, but sometimes I've played some jam session gigs, which I don't do a lot of, but I, I have this steady Wednesday gig I've been doing for a while with the, um, pianist he's a trombonist and pianist named reggie watkins we play this gig on wednesdays and it turns into a jam session like the second half of the gig and sometimes it's nice to bring this smaller setup so when drummers sit in they're kind of forced to deal with it you know and they may even express to me like i don't have anything to say without the tom toms but i think it's just good to get people thinking about that and having to try to to make it work you know mm -hmm. Not to punish anyone or make them, make them struggle, you know, because yeah, I definitely right. struggle with it as well, you know. Now, I noticed uh, when I saw you play the other night that you, you kept tweaking the snare tuning a little bit. I don't know, if, is that is that just a habit or do you adjust the your snare tuning? drum, you said? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of a fiddler, you know, okay. like <laughs> I think it's more habit than anything. Um, I think as far as snare response, like I fiddle with that probably even more than the tuning um usually at least in my mind i do and some tunes i want the i don't like to have the snares too tight but sometimes on a gig you know like you get to the end of the gig and you pack up the drum you, you open it up for the next gig and you hit the snare and you're like well i can't believe i had the snares that tight <laughs> and i think sometimes just the room and what you're hearing you end up wanting to hear a little more clarity or maybe i tune a little higher in the same the same way but generally i i you know it's just maybe maybe sometimes with for brush playing out i might want it a little looser just so you know just the kind of middle of this drum brush strokes can sound a little fatter and not so sharp and, and pointy um not that i'm a great brush player by any stretch but um i think it's just situational like anything else and a little bit of a habit as you said mm -hmm. you know do you mess with like the other drums? Does bass drum tuning ever get adjusted for? Sometimes rooms? it's more. That's more. Um, I mean, I'm pretty strict. If I'm bringing my own drums, I usually fine tune a little bit as I'm setting up, and that includes the bass drum. I'll kind of go over the drum and just see how it's sounding and trying to keep it in tune with itself. Um, sometimes I'll find myself reaching down between the floor tom and the snare drum right in front of me and tightening the top two T rods on the bass drum just to get a little more snap or loosening you know, in the, within a tune just to get a little more bottom, but not a ton of more bottom, but just a little bit depending on the situation. But I don't think that's real important. It's just probably more just what I'm hearing at the moment. It's not even necessary probably, you know. All right, let's talk about tape on the cymbals because I have not figured out how to do it. What are you doing when you put some tape on the cymbals? What are you trying to do to the cymbal? And then how do you go about it? Yeah, I'm not sure if I really know what I'm doing in a, in a, like a, a formulaic kind of system. 
but I've always just, I've, I grew up seeing my dad would have tape on cymbals. I was the older drummers have tape on cymbals. To me, I'd always rather have a cymbal be too washy than too dry because you can always mellow it out. You can't add sustain. Same with drums. You can't add sustain. Like if I were to play double ply heads, I can't make them sound like single ply heads, but I can make a single ply head maybe perhaps sound more like a double ply head. Same thing goes with cymbals. I can always kind of mellow them out if I want to. Um, and I've never loved like moon gel and those kind of things. They're cool. I mean, I don't like, like it so much. Um, um, although it can work, but I, I tend to like tape gaffer tape. Um, some symbols I'll tape a lot under the bell just to kind of mellow out the symbol and deaden it a little bit. And then sometimes just situationally, I, I will add, um, a little bit more on a, a certain gig just to try to calm it down a little bit. I mean, I want to be able to do some of that naturally with my touch and my playing. So I, so I'm rarely adding day to day, but if someone were to come out, look at my, look at my symbols, I probably have more on there or more symbols probably have tape on them than I even realized just cause I've over the years put something on and just got used to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, it just stays on. Usually. I mean, occasionally I might think years later or something like, Oh, maybe let's see what this sounds like without the tape now, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll sometimes have to heat the tape up to get it off clean without leaving a bunch of marks. And then I'll end up putting it back on. And, <laughs> right. like, and the same way with drums, like I, I'm more tape than like, um, I never use internal mufflers. You know, I rarely will use like, like drum product, external mufflers, you know, that clip mm -hmm. onto a hoop or something. Um, generally just some tape, some gaff tape, you know, it was in particular, it was your, I think it was your thinner old K had like a handful of chunks of tape on it. I don't think that one has a ton. If I can remember, it was one of the two K's you had. Remember, but the, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some stuff had some, had some on there. Um, the okay that I play all the time and this other old A that I kind of use as a substitute, their keyhole is so bad that if you don't have something near the keyhole, it, the, the hole will fall and the symbol will start hanging like, oh. you know what I mean? So I actually started using these. <laughs> I can't believe I'm even saying this, but this company makes these products called Grombles. Do you know what those are? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, I always thought they were silly in, in a way. I mean, not silly. They work. They work, so they're not silly. But they work if your symbol's keyhole because they'll kind of create like a new um, stability in the hole of the symbol that you can put that through the hole and put that on the stand. So in that old K, I have one of those because it'll just fall and and I can't even play it anymore. It's like... <laughs> yeah. so all right before we dive into some of your favorite albums i wanted to talk a little bit about band leading because i feel how many bands do you currently have and um, the big thing for me is how do you start a band like were these bands that started years ago or are you constantly starting new projects um i don't know how many i have right now i mean um offhand currently i have um a lot of these are co-led bands. Um, I have a group called Thoth Trio with uh, one of my best friends. Um, they're both some of my closest friends, but uh, my longtime buddy, Paul Thompson on bass, we were on Maynard Ferguson's band together. Uh, we have this trio with a saxophone player named Ben Opie. Um, we've been playing together about 20 years. And um, so that's kind of an ongoing project, mostly playing Ben's original music, some of Paul's original music, and some tunes. Um, occasionally, we'll even do themed shows, like an all Ornette Coleman show or all Thelonious Monk show. Um, so there's that band, which is just kind of saxophone, bass, acoustic bass, drums. Um, I have a band called Throckmorton Plot, um, which is is like an all improvised band. It's the same guy, same two guys as in Thought Trio. Paul's playing acoustic bass. Uh, ben Opie is playing alto saxophone with effects. And then he has like laptop and all kind of bells and whistles. And he's just kind of doing a lot of sonic stuff. Um, and then a, a guitar player friend of mine named Josh Wolf. Um, and that band kind of explores different sounds and textures and grooves and feels. And that band is an offshoot of a band I used to lead, lead with Paul Thompson called Beam, which was like the hip hop kind of jungly fusion, whatever you want to call it. Um, that was um, Paul on electric bass, 
primarily, occasionally acoustic. Uh, a friend of mine named Steve Lande playing a four string bass with piccolo string. So he was playing like a higher register and he had like two small, small refrigerator sized uh, cases of like analog effects, you know, pedals and whatnot. Analog might not be, might be the right word, but it was all like, uh, it wasn't like multi effects units. It was all these drawers of pedals and whatnot. And then we had an MC, like a rapper and a DJ um, using actual vinyl, not like CD, you know, DJ, CDJ, whatever they call it, or um, Serato. So this is, this is back in the, you know, 2000 to 2006. Um, and then currently there's a band called, um, well, we're kind of defunct. I have a band called Smash Your Wagon, which is two guitars and drums. Um, and we made a record that I really like a lot um, about 10 years ago. And we, we've done some shows semi-recently and I'm trying to find maybe a, a person to fill the the one guitar role. Our original guitar player, Rick Malls, kind of hasn't been playing much um out gigging so josh wolf and i are kind of looking for somebody to maybe to maybe rejuvenate that band um i'm probably forgetting something oh and of course um the organ trio with uh dan wilson from akron ohio and cliff barnes from youngstown you know typical guitar bass excuse me guitar organ drums trio and that's more straight ahead but we'll play some groovy stuff as well and then i have a quartet i lead as well um with John Shannon, Paul Thompson on acoustic bass, um, Scott Bonney on alto saxophone. That's playing more kind of tunes that we all grew up listening to, like from our, you know, from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, kind of, and standards as well. Oh, one more band. So I do have a bunch of them. I have a band called, um, co-led band called Fourth River with John Shannon on guitar and a great bass player named Jeff Grubbs on acoustic bass. And that music is um, a little more free, spacey, kind of ECM. Um, you know, I get to pretend I'm Paul Motion or or Tom Rainey or somebody or Jim Black or Joey Barron or Jack DeJanette or Ed Blackwell. You know, it's a little freer, some of John's compositions. Um, or we'll play standards kind of in a, uh, a lot of situations where we're not playing time. We're just kind of moving through the, 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 the melodic and harmonic movement of the piece. Um, or sometimes we'll just play completely free. So I guess your question was about band leading. Um, yes. Like, like a band like fourth river, I just approached John and said, Hey, I want to try to have a band that plays in this zone um, dynamically, texturally um, to explore those, um, cause I love playing that way. I know those guys play great in that style. They're also great straight ahead players. We can, we can do that if we want, but we usually with that band, try to keep it more loose, um, uh -huh. where the quartet, David, David Throckmorton quartet, it's more tuned, just more in time kind of playing songs and, you know, um, trying to make it feel good. DTC, is, is the same way we're playing material typically, but Cliff and Dan have a, it's very rhythmic, that band. They're such great rhythm players and they have, uh, we have a really great chemistry rhythmically. Everybody listens really hard. Cliff's really great at reinventing like songs on the spot and adding a new feel to it. Or, you know, we'll do tempo changes sometimes or um, like during the tune or we'll call a tune and I'll think it's going to go how it went last time. And somebody will start playing something I never heard before. And you're like, okay, we're going to do it like that. And then you have to just kind of sink or swim, you know, but I think like not to get too long winded, but some of these bands like beam back in the day, that was specifically to play in that style. It was very drummy. Uh, I was a little younger and more selfish. I wanted to really just play my, my stuff, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that was. But I love that music and incorporating electronic music and hip hop with live instruments. Um, Thoth Trio is a little more avant-garde, but still a, a saxophone, bass, drums trio. But, but with, I think the identity of that band is more, obviously the players, but Ben's writing is, is, is really the focus of that band. So, and he writes for us, for our personalities as well. So we're just trying to, you know, and all the bands are so different. I think that's the reason 
for the different bands mm -hmm. is to to try to find different zones to play in so I don't get too bored, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when you get called to do some singer-songwriter stuff, sometimes that's just a nice change to just play grooves and lay it down and and not think so much about all this improvising and whatnot. I mean, you're mm -hmm. still improvising in some way, even with that, but you're just trying to play the songs well and, you know, be supportive and have a good sound and have a good time and, and um, kind of still drive the bus in a way, but, but just be as musical as you can, you know, that might not answer your question at all. Yeah, it did. It did. Uh, the follow up. Um, let's say you have an idea for a band. Like yeah. I've got an idea. I want to play like um, big fun Miles Davis era. I yeah. get some players who are like, sure, let's do it. Do you, did you come in with a handful of material? I mean, how did it get to the point when you have a song? Book? No, I mean, I think the bands that play tunes, <clears throat> I may suggest songs and see how that's received from the other members. Um, the improvising bands, obviously there's no material, but I will pick people that I think will understand what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. And people that that want to do it, that want to be involved. That's that's sometimes the hardest thing is just finding people that really want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm fortunate to play with some great musicians, but sometimes it's just hard to find time to to sneak in a rehearsal or to get people that want to rehearse or that mm -hmm. will learn material. So you're presented with all those um, obstacles. So I think it's just if, if you're starting something new, finding people that you want to do it with and that you get along with, you know, and that understand the direction you're trying to go in, you know, and sometimes it's maybe finding someone that's really interested that doesn't so much understand the direction yet, but you can kind of hip them to what you want to do and they'll check, they're willing to check it out and really um, jump into that to try to make it as good as they can, you know, as, as good as they can, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes that means younger, younger musicians who have a little more time or her, that are excited to play, you know, mm. as we get older, sometimes we can lose that. Some people can lose that excitement. I try to keep projects going. So I stay excited about playing, you know? Yeah. I mean, to get someone to rehearse is like the hardest part for me. It's really hard. <laughs> it really is. And, and it's hard. Even the guys I play with all the time, it's hard to get them booked for a gig because they're always working you know? and yeah. they want to do it. You're like, man, can you do a gig next month on this? No. Can you, okay. Can you do two months out? No. Okay, let's book three months out. And then we'll start trying to book like every month after that, like sometimes three or four months at a time just to get it on the book so you can do it, you know, mm -hmm. or not. You're going to be struggling to find musicians, you know. Right, right. All right, let's jump into your top 10 albums and see where yeah. that goes. You go in any order. Yeah, well, let me just say first, um, I thought about this a little bit in the last couple of days when I take – these long walks. I've, I've been listening to some stuff, trying to think about what I should include. So I, I, I set a little bit of a guideline for myself or some ground rules, I should say. I picked stuff from when I was born after. I didn't go like really early stuff. There's so okay. many of that. So let me just say like, I could have picked any Coltrane album with Elvin. I could have picked any Miles record with Tony. Um, I could have picked any Thelonious Monk record or anyone at Coleman album with Billy Higgins, Red Blackwell, but I didn't pick any of those because they're. I was just trying to stick with stuff that's a little more current, even though it's still some of it may seem dated to like younger people. Um, I also could have picked any Steve Coleman Five Elements record, but I didn't, or any Keith Jarrett with Jack, and I didn't. So mm -hmm. I'll just. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of like obvious ones for me that I that I left alone. But okay. uh, so moving forward, <laughs> the first one I picked. Um, and I, I, I have all these CDs in there. I picked this record. This is the Chicory Electric Band, Inside Out, um, from, I think this is from 90. And this is the fourth of their five albums before they split up. They later recorded another album. And this band was huge for me. It was like kind of the band that got me excited about playing, um, wanting to play instrumental music. Um, my dad's a was a great drummer. My older brother plays drums. So I grew up hearing them play. And my brother went to the military band um, after high school. He's four and a half years older than me. And he was stationed in Virginia and he came home for like leave. And I was, 
I think I was still in maybe seventh or eighth grade or eighth grade maybe. And he's like, Dave, I, I saw this band a couple of weeks ago, the Chicory Electric Band. And it was, they were touring, I think on the first record. So like 86. And um, he played me some stuff off the first album. And I remember, I vividly remember saying out loud, are you sure this is one guy? <laughs> when I heard him play. He's like, yeah, it's one guy. And I was like, man, he sounds like Steve Gadd, just like on steroids or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And he kind of does sound like that. So and moving forward, the fourth album, that album, Inside Out, I think it's their most experimental album. Um, it almost has some classical sounds to my ear. Um, and it's just like that band, every album is really different from one to the next. And that one always just knocked me out. Um, especially when I was, I think I was still in high school when that came out and it was just really groundbreaking for me, like just blew my mind and I would try to play along to it and probably didn't understand what was happening half the time. And actually the first time I saw that band live was on that tour. And it was just like, you know, the greatest thing ever, you know, seeing that stuff <laughs> in person was and, and getting to see that they can play it live, you know? Yeah. Was that was he playing the three rack tom setup at that point? That was the first album with three rack toms. Yeah, he's playing the <laughs> he's playing the recording custom kit with with that's the first time he started using standard size rack toms. You know, I can totally <laughs> geek out about all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I got to meet him. And he was pretty nice. Um, sometimes he can like I've heard people say it's you never know what you're going to get. He he was really nice to me. Um, he let me go check out his kit. Not, not play it, but like go look at it up close and mm -hmm. have some photos somewhere of me sitting nice. at it looking like <laughs> I'm shocked, you know. That was probably like 80 pounds ago too. But um Did you yeah, have man, a it was, yeah, I had, well he had a lot of hair. I didn't <laughs> I, I still had short hair, but not before the, the days with no hair. But yeah, that record was just knocked me out, man. I, and I listened to it the other day, and it's still almost a mystery sometimes to me. It's like, man, how 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 do you play that way and read this stuff? You know, mm -hmm. like he and Vinny particular to me, I, I, they're the, the way they can interpret music, you know, um, in that style, like a fusion kind of jazz style. It's just unbelievable, you know, and their sounds are so good. Um, they're so imaginative and so creative and it feels great. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing I'll say about Weckl. Like he's sometimes people would bash him over the year about being too slick or too worked out. I don't think he's really worked out at all. I think he's a really amazing improviser. He has a way of playing, but to me, and sure everybody has licks, but he always, to me, what amazes me about him. Um, I mean, everything amazes me about him, but any band he's playing in, it's like the best that band ever sounds like he makes the band sound so good, you know? So I'll, 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 I'll stop there, you know? All right. Let's go. We can go on the Weckle for two hours. Cause that was, yeah. that was my entry way to straight ahead jazz. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's something else, man. Um, what, what's the next one? The next one is, um, it's a hip hop record. I'm a giant hip hop fan. Um, a lot of the stuff's net again, like going to be, a lot of older stuff just based on my age, but this record, um, mm. this is a uh, Trap Called Quest's third album. This is called Midnight Marauders from 93. And um, I would say that this, along with the second Public Enemy record, it takes Nation of Millions to hold us back, are probably my two favorite hip hop records ever. I just picked this Tribe record. It just blew my mind when it came out. Um, I remember a friend buying it on cassette, playing it in his in his car a bunch when it first came out before I bought it. And I was just like, wow, this is just like just this new level of sophistication and creativity with the music. Um, I don't really know how much to say it influences my drumming, although it it does on some level. Um, I, I really sit down and think about okay, this is the beat from this record or, or anything like that. But just the way that they, the collage kind of aspect of sampling and putting drums together and adding different horns from this record. And, you know, it's just mind blowing. And Q-Tip's just a, a genius at, at making, making these records. It's, um, 
I don't know what else to say about it. It's just mind blowing, you know, and I can still listen to it any day of the week, all the way through no skips, just like banger after banger. It's just like mm. some of the baddest stuff I've ever heard. Really? Did you, did you, you know? play to it? Yeah. Sometimes I, I didn't go crazy with playing along with hip hop records. Um, I'm sure this is one that I did a fair amount, probably in the nineties. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably didn't go crazy with that. And maybe sometimes if I did play it to it, I would maybe just overplay to it, you know, <laughs> like play the grooves and then try to maybe, although it's totally inappropriate, I may have practiced blowing over that stuff because it's so consistent and it feels so good, mm -hmm. you know? And also this might be an interesting thing to say, like I'm probably as it, I'm probably also influenced drum wise, drumming wise by the MCs you know, the rhythms and, and cadence and patterns of how they rhyme, you know, there's, there's a lot of melody to that. And I try to, same with jazz drumming or jazz um, instrumentalists, like trying to play like a trumpet player or a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about, about some of the MCs I love, you know, like Rakim or Big Daddy Kane or um, Nas, like these guys are just rhythmic virtuosos, you know, mm -hmm. and phrasing, really amazing phrasing. Man, I, Eric B. Rakim, let the rhythm hit him. First tape I think I ever bought. That was it. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Rakim, I, I mean, he's probably my favorite MC of all time. Like, hands down. Not probably, he is. Nice. He's, he's a genius, man. All right, third record. Third record is um, from around the same time as this record. Um, Brand from Marsalis, Bloomington, which is a live record. Um with just the trio um, with Jeff Tane Watts on drums and uh, Bob Hurst, Robert Hurst on bass. And um, I, I could have picked any Branford record with Tane. It's, you know, um, I think you and I were talking about him last week, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, talking about Tane and how much I loved his playing. Um, he's just great. The music is really imaginative. Um, they play mostly Branford's originals on there. They play a Monk tune. Um, it might also play another non Branford tune. Um, but I just, I've always loved that format, saxophone, bass, and drums. You know, a lot of times that ends up being tenor, a lot of records. Um, there's just so much space to play in that context. And, um, there's just so much going on in that record. You know, I love the, I love the way it's recorded. It's pretty raw. Mm -hmm. It sounds really, it sounds real. It sounds like you're just standing next to the instruments. I always love that about it. It just sounds believable. Sometimes you hear like a fusion record when I grew up and it just sounded like, I, I can never get drums to sound like this, you know, whether it's the, the slick recording or reverb or all the compression or gates or whatever. I don't even know a lot about that stuff, but this just sounds like real instruments mm -hmm. being played on the highest level. I love the way the bass is recorded. Um, with just a microphone, it just sounds so, so, so real. Uh, Branford's soprano playing is beautiful on this. Um, and there was like a concert film that kind of came out around the time of this record called, the, I think it was called The Music Tells You. And there was a lot of footage from that album. I wish that would somehow surface the whole album, the video, because I know they recorded it. Mm -hmm. I would just die to see the video of the whole record. But, um, that was was he playing the white sonar kit in that, right? He was playing the uh, the sonar light Babinga kit. Oh right, yeah. With like I think he, I think that kit was a twenty inch bass drum, twelve thirteen up top, and mounted floor toms, which kind of is odd, but like just sounds so good, man. That kit's amazing, you know. So do and you ever a get Pittsburgh a... too? So I wanted to represent Pittsburgh, man. You know. Right, right. Do you ever get? I mean, I feel like Tane. It's just no holds barred almost all the time. Do you ever get to play that way? Do you ever feel comfortable enough yeah, to just? Yeah, I mean, I try to play that rip? way. I can't do it. Like, <laughs> I can't do it like him. I, I, I think there was a period like um, in the '90s, early 2000s, when I would get to play, and maybe like early Thoth Trio, I was probably trying to really play like Tane, trying to play mm -hmm. like him a lot. You know, and I think a lot of my favorite drummers 25 drummers or 20 drummers i went through periods of really trying to sound like all of them not not to be a clone 
um, just to try to develop like and learn how they play and how they play time and how they get a sound. And Tane was one of them. I, 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 he's really an amazing musician and great writer. He writes great material. Mm -hmm. Um, I think just playing a pickup gig or sitting in a session, you, you maybe can't sit down and, you know, go balls to the wall like that. But, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I love the way he plays like, you know, from his simple playing to when it's really dense and, um, I don't know what the word would be like conversational, you know, mm -hmm. and I love the way it makes the other musicians play a lot of the times, but I mean, like he, he still sounds great playing four quarter notes on the cymbal to me too, you know? Mm-hmm. So do you have any advice for anyone who wants to get into that real interactive style to not just sound annoying? <laughs> and like, I think it's like anything else, man. You, you, you have to, I think you have to learn to play normal <laughs> or inside or, or like the function of normal drum, the role of the drums. You have to learn to do that kind of before trying to just, do that you know mm -hmm. i wouldn't recommend somebody just start out playing drums and listen to elvin playing with train on like a live recording and say learn to do that you know i might say let's learn to play simple you know mm -hmm. i mean that might be years you know learning basic rhythm and a basic rock beat and basic cymbal beat and then eventually as you get more comfortable hopefully you're listening and 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 you have a a place where you're trying to go for something as opposed to just, you know, just throwing it out there and seeing what happens, you know? What'd you say the other night? Having a fit on the drums? <laughs> I'm, I may have said that. Yeah. I, think some of, I probably sound like I'm having a fit on the drums half the time I play. All right. What's your number four record? <laughs> this one is a little earlier and this record uh, blew my mind. I don't know if you know this one, you know, this record, Ah, Steve very Kong, recently with Steve, Steve Jordan. Kong Eyewitness with Steve Jordan. Oh, yeah. Um, this came out, I think, in 82, 83. What's the record again? I think I talked over you. Steve Kong. It's called, it's called Eyewitness, which was the name of that band. Um, so Eyewitness with Steve Kong. It's, it's under Steve Kong's name, Steve Kong Eyewitness. Um, Anthony Jackson on bass, Steve Kong on guitar. Manalo Badrena on percussion and Steve Jordan on drums. And um, they had a live record that came up before this um, called Blades or Modern Times. I think it had different titles in Japan versus America. Um, this record is the first studio record. And um, I, I pulled this out too, just as reference. This record is another Steve Kahn, I don't know if there's too much glare, another Steve Kahn record called Public Access from um, like 90-ish, something like that, 89, 90. That has Weckl on drums. I had heard that first, the Steve Kahn with Weckl, and then found out about that, that was a, an older band that Steve Jordan played in. Mm. So I kind of later looked for that record forever. I eventually found it on cassette, and it blew my mind. Um, the drum sounds on that record in like 82 or whenever it was recorded, it, it almost to my ear sounds like they were really influenced by the police, kind of. It sounds mm -hmm. like, that might be ridiculous. Maybe they weren't, but to my ear, it sounds like they were checking out the police. Um, and Steve Jordan, it's, he's still kind of playing fusion. You know, I think most people know him from playing songs and playing on hit records and, and just having this amazing groove. And he does have that, like as much as anyone does. But he's a really imaginative, unique kind of fusion drummer i hate mm -hmm. i mean the f word sorry but like <laughs> it's kind of fusion music um instrumental electric music the percussion playing is really um unique it's not a lot of patterns it's just kind of you know a little of this a little of that and um the guy who engineered those records i think i'm saying his name right it's malcolm Pollack or pollock that guy got the, some of the best drum sounds like for that kind of music man like really scary how great the drum sound um on that record and um really interesting stuff with cowbell kind of coming out of like what gad did but like a different slant on it mm -hmm. and then that translates i think into 
when Weckl play with the band and Dennis Chambers play with the band, they, they're all they're You can hear that they're, they all checked out what Steve Jordan was doing with that band. That's an amazing, amazing record. It is. I feel like anything Steve plays on sounds modern, like his drum sounds, no matter what. Yeah. It always yeah. sounds and, current. And, and like you could say this record is dated in a way, but in a way it's like it sounds brand new. It's like I can't believe mm-hmm. it's not as dated as it should be. You know what right. I mean? It's yeah. like, it goes wow, anybody else. That. <laughs> you know, it's really great, really great record. Was he? Is there like some double hi hat or something weird going on? I've in his seen setup. pictures of that. I don't know how often he actually used it or how it came into play. So I have the same question. I don't know. I don't yeah, know what I he should have. I should have asked him when I interviewed him years ago because I feel like Marcus Gilmore is doing that now with two high hats. Like I think Steve. Well, I did think that. Steve Jordan's thing might have been like connected by some weird rod. Right. You know? right. Yeah, I think they were just normal high hats. I mean, I think what Marcus I've seen Marcus do and even in person, like it's more like. The second little hi hat, he's almost just playing with his the back of his foot, the heel of his foot, mm-hmm. and that guy's a total freak of nature. By the way, like I'm not <laughs> going to get to him in this list, but as I say this all the time, as far as drummers younger than me, that he freaks me out more than anybody. He's like a new breed of drummer and just a a really nice cat. I've got to hang with him a little bit, and we'll text back and forth sometimes, and he's a uh, He's a special, special player, Marcus is. Mm-hmm. What's your fifth record? Fifth record, um, I could have picked any number of records with this drummer on it, but I chose this one. Um, this is a record by a pianist named Frank Kimbrough called Play, which features the great Paul Motion on drums. Mm. It was a piano trio record. Um, he obviously played a lot, Paul, with, with Keith Jarrett's American Quartet and some trio stuff. Um, his his own trio with Joe Lovano and Bill Frizzell is one of my favorite trios to hear him play in. But this is a really beautiful piano trio recording. Um, I love the sound of the recording. Frank's tunes, as well as others on there, really beautiful. Um, and Paul really opened my ears up to, I mean, along with other great drummers. But um, him more than any, to my, he just opened up my ears to a new way of playing drums. Um, not always playing time playing these beautiful like a painter would play the drums or something that might sound totally corny um just the way he plays cymbals the way he gets sounds um the way he plays with brushes or plays with the sticks it's it's just amazing and and i think that might be one people don't know as much as his own recordings or or stuff with like bill evans or keith jarrett um i tend to like paul's playing later in life the early playing is great and i really believe that what's so special about his free playing or his playing that's not in time. It's so informed by the fact that he can play great time, Mm. you know, Um, there's a childlike quality to his playing, which people will always comment on. There's a a documentary about Paul that just got released. If you haven't seen it, which is worth Mm. watching, it's called motion in motion. And a lot of the comments of these musicians that, play with him they say the same thing i think it's like like he sounds like a child sometimes like it's this youthful um innocence in his playing and um it's just really beautiful man he's he's one of my all-time drum heroes he's he's amazing i gotta check that one out what's it again it's called play by frank kimbrough and frank actually passed um sometime during COVID. I don't think it was COVID related but um far too young to pass away and just a really brilliant brilliant uh musician something my friend tom went told me a beautiful story about frank that he um i think he emailed him or wrote him and inquired about playing some of his compositions and frank got right back to him was nice enough to send him all these charts and so i think i need to get some of those from 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 tom and start playing some of these tunes just to just to pay respects to to how much i love his uh his music yeah for sure all right number six this one and this one might be my, if I could only listen to one album in terms of drumming, just for drumming only, this might be my favorite drum album of all time. This is uh, mm. Michael Brecker's first album called Michael Brecker. Uh, I think it came out 86 with the great Jack DeJohnette on drums, um, Kenny Kirkland on piano, uh, Charlie Hayden on acoustic bass, Pat Metheny on guitar. Um Almost the same band as Pat's record, 8081, 
but but adding Kenny Kirkland on piano, um, and mine is Dewey Redman, who also played saxophone on that. But uh, the first time I heard this, I remember buying this um, probably four or five years after it came out, and I was just blown away right off the bat by the the sound he, he was getting off out of the drums. Um, I think when I first heard it, um, it, was, it was a little more of an open sound than I was used to playing, like hearing records with Gad or Weckl or the guys at, at that time. It was a little rounder. The bass drum sound had more of its own, but not tuned as high as a lot of old bebop kind of sounding records or blue note records. Um, he always, to me, just gets such a beautiful sound out of the drums on any record. Um, and similar to Paul Motion's playing, I tend to like Jack, like from that era, kind of newer. I, mean, I love mm -hmm. early Jack on Miles recordings and Blue Note records, all that stuff, Charles Lloyd records, Jackie McLean records. But when he started playing kind of a bigger kit, like sonar, bigger kit with, with more cymbals, there's just something about the way he plays. Um, he never sounds repetitive to me, like he's playing patterns or he's playing worked out. Um, even the coughing, it never sounds like, it. it's like familiar, but it's always new to me if that makes any sense at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. It's like a style of playing as opposed to things he always plays. You know, you know, it's him right away, but it's like never the same, you know, and it swings super hard. And um, he's got some great like rolling way of playing kind of Elvin has that too, but something about Jack, the way he just plays the snare drum even. And the symbol, it's like, it's like magic almost mm -hmm. to my ears, you know? If someone said do a Jack DeJunet impression, what would you do? I would, I would do a really poor Jack DeJunet impression, <laughs> which I often try to do, you know? Um, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I, I think when I try to get into that Jack mode, I, I, there may be certain feels that he plays straight eighth music with that I try to, recreate which are like a looser straight eighth feel but in terms of like playing the symbol he's very good at reinventing the symbol not just the beat and not just playing ding 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 although he can do that as good as anybody um he has this way of i don't know how to just try so i, so I guess to answer your question i just try to be less repetitive i try mm. to not play the same old stuff over and over you know, and then probably a lot of double strokes on the toms and the snare drum, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of rolling stuff. <laughs> Which I probably do more now than ever. Like I, I've, I've kind of got into that more in the last 10 or 15 years, as opposed to when I was a little younger, you know? Yeah, it's pretty mysterious. I'm sure we'll come back to that when we get together later. Cause I need to figure that out <laughs> let's yeah go to, let's go to hey, number man. seven <laughs> i'm trying to figure all this stuff out man. he's he's special man i mean he's he's easily one of my top you know three or four drummers of all time you know hands did down you, did you play along to these more modern records or is it more just listening and absorbing um i i again I, like when you asked about the tribe called quest record i i probably played along to records more in that era like in the 90s late eighties through the nineties. Um, I don't really do that much anymore. I probably mm -hmm. should. Um, cause there are benefits to it for sure. Like pretending like you're in the band and trying to react. Um, but it's weird in some ways, you know, the, the musicians are reacting to what that drummer played on the record. So you can't really converse, but you can try to, you know, uh, you know, play along with that same vibe that's created on the record you know, mm -hmm. in a jazz context, you know? All right. What's your number seven? Um, number seven is this record um, from 93, this record called What We Do by the John Schofield Quartet. Um, Before you go on, is that out of, out of print? I can't find it anywhere. Um, I think you can still find it on like Amazon. The CD will pop up occasionally. Um, okay. If I ever see it, I go record. I go to record stores a bunch. If I see it, I'll grab it for you. Yeah, because I um, saw he put out a compilation of the other three records, and that's not part of it. Yeah, um, it's out there. It may be getting harder to find. Okay. Um, you know, the the first record quartet record, Sco put out a few years earlier. 
there was a record with Jack on drums called Time on My Hands, which is also frighteningly amazing. Um, and then the first record, the first time I heard Bill, I was actually playing, I was 19 playing a summer gig in Cincinnati at an amusement park, playing drums at an amusement park. And there were some older musicians that also played there and they listened to jazz as well. And one of the guys let me borrow the record before this called Meant to Be, which was the first record Bill made with Sco. And I heard that in 92. And from the first track, I, I remember having headphones on and just thinking like, who is, who is this? Like, who is this guy? I never heard him before. And he just blew my mind. And I went to the record store that week in Cincinnati looking for it. And he had released another, Sco had released another record. Um, they didn't have that meant to be. They had this one called Grace Under Pressure, which has Joey Barron and Bill Frizzell on it and Charlie Hayden. So I bought that and I loved it, but it wasn't the one with Bill Stewart. And I kept looking for it. I couldn't find it. And then about a year later, I was at a Camelot music, you know, from for those old record store heads. And I found this record, uh, What We Do, which was the, the second record with Bill Stewart. And it just changed everything for me. I was like, this guy is one of the greatest drummers I've ever heard. And he's, he was in his twenties, I believe, you know, mm -hmm. so developed, um, great sound, amazing cymbal sounds playing old K's back then. And just so, so uh, articulate and swinging. And I, it's just a, one of my favorite records of all time. You know, man, I can't believe you pulled that one out because that's that is the one for me. That's the Bill Stewart record. Right it's there. it's so <laughs> good, man. It's so scary. I mean, that was the first time I paid attention to the left foot because it's just so oh, same here. Part. I think I noticed um, Jack some stuff with Jack's left foot, and actually Vinny, not in a jazz context so much, but Vinny always had really nasty left foot stuff. But Bill was the guy where I was like, okay, I gotta develop this fourth limb that i've kind of ignored you know yeah yeah get out syncopation left foot here we go <laughs> yeah he's just he's just so good i can't even believe it man. you know man so what's that record called again it's called what we do what we do that was the one and i had dennis yeah. Irwin on bass the, the late great dennis Irwin and uh, lovano that was lovano's last record with that group at that time i actually went to see that band on that tour at that time and um it's either Hidden Valley or Seven Springs, like a ski resort out uh, east of Pittsburgh. And um, and when I got, when I got there, uh, Lovano had just left the band. I think like a couple nights before, he was his last mm. time with the band. So I saw them play trio, playing that material, and it was just mind blowing. I think I might have a cassette boot bootleg of that somewhere. You know, <laughs> I need to buy a cassette player if I want to listen to it. You know, <laughs> what's your number eight? Eight is, um, yikes, it's falling apart. Is this record by DJ Shadow, this record called Introducing. And this came out, I think, in 96, I want to say. It's the first time I heard like a all sample based um, production kind of like album. Like people would call those people like beat makers now. Um, but inspired by hip hop culture, but it's like an instrumental um, beat kind of album created from sampling. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just a masterpiece to, and to my ears. It's one of my favorite records of all time. Um, just blew my mind that somebody could create these kind of instrumental compositions only using samples, you know? Mm -hmm. I think he, he said in interviews, the whole record was basically made with a turntable and a sampler and maybe like a DJ mixer or something like that, you know, um, to think. <laughs> and then like, he wasn't even using any like post-production stuff. Maybe when he went to mix somewhere, they, they may have added a little bit, but very little. Um, it's, have you ever heard that record? Yeah. I was going to ask if you ever tried to learn that crazy drum break he chopped up in the first cut. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, there's too much bass drum stuff. Like I can't, I don't play double bass drum, so I, <laughs> I can't play any of that stuff. But I mean, I could, I've, but I've, I've emulated a lot of not actual parts, but it, I think it's, it's, it's influenced my drumming, you know, for sure. And I would say that the bands I created like Beam and Smasher Wagon, they're really based heavily off of 
that record and other things like it. I think prior to that, guys that I love that make beats or uh, hip hop producers, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, there's so many great ones from Mantronics to um, the Bomb Squad to Pete Rock or DJ Premier, all those and, and so many more. Um, and every bit is amazing as Shadow. Uh, I'm not taking anything away from them, but it was like more repetitive. And like, you might have this kind of one beat that rides through the whole song. They may pull some snares out here or there, or take the hi-hat out or just have the hi-hat playing. And maybe there's a little B section here or there, but these were like instrumental compositions, mm -hmm. you know, it almost sounds like a, a crazy electronic band. You know, I don't even know if that makes sense, but, and I've turned so many people onto this and a lot of guys love it as well. And some people just don't really, understand why i like it so much <laughs> um, i think that's another record that just sounds so modern no matter what yeah and i've heard him talk I, i'm a big fan I, I listen to any interview i can find of him and i think sometimes he talks about like wishing a lot of his old fans would embrace his new music in the same way and i i some of his new stuff is amazing but i think the sample clearing samples legally has become so difficult that it's hard to reproduce stuff like that unless you just make it and don't sell it and just throw it on the internet somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I, I always want to do more of stuff like that, like um, with groups I have, but you know, the stuff I stuff would, the stuff I do probably would slide under the radar because it's not selling a bunch of copies or anything like that, mm -hmm. but you never, no, you never know who's going to want to use it for something. And then you have to, try to clear it on the back end or something you know oh yeah no you don't want to be stuck in that yeah. <laughs> situation i think that vocal sample is the great drummer um george marsh in that opening it track. is yeah 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 it totally is yep uh, hopefully he got a couple dollars from that he's such a sweet guy he probably didn't he probably did and, and I, I don't know what to think about any of that really like i often think about from a lot of newer hip-hop music what, what's missing from it I, I really think it's just it's still great and people are still really creative and doing amazing things, but um, the use of all the sampling is in that collage aspect of taking bits and pieces and making something new. That's really so much of the culture. And, and when you can't do that, it's, it's hurting the art form, but I understand people need to get paid for what they do. So I'm, I don't know how to feel about it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I think I think more like Andy Warhol. Like, did he have to get clearance from all these ad agencies? To yeah, talk and to me, that's even, that's more. It's almost more jive and more obvious. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are definitely hip hop, like more pop hip hop stuff that I don't love, where they just took a song and run and rapped over it, rhymed mm -hmm. over it. The stuff I tend to like is making new from the old. You know, mm -hmm. and we're all doing that in our playing, taking bits and pieces of the musicians we love and trying to. You know, you put it all in a funnel and it comes out sounding like you, as people say, mm. you know. So for me, it's all these great musicians, but it's also people like P-Rock and DJ Premier and Jay Dilla and DJ Shadow and, you know, Showbiz and Diamond D. I, I could go on and on, you know. We got two more. Yeah, That's two more. Okay. Um, this one is a little more recent, not super duper recent. This is a this Wayne Krantz record. Um, called Krantz Carlock Lafave, which features um, Keith Carlock on drums. This is their first studio record of this group. Everything before that were, were live records. Um, and Keith, uh, you know, we're not super close friends, but we're kind of old drum buddies, and we we did a clinic together once. I, I think I think he told me his first was his first drum clinic was a clinic that I was doing. I got him to play with me and play on his own and um i met him when i was on mainers band in the late 90s i was a big fan of wayne's writing and guitar playing he had a band prior to that with um the great zach danziger on drums and i would try to go see that band when i could and when keith came into the band i was like who is who's this guy you know and mm -hmm. keith was coming through pittsburgh actually um playing a um, kind of a smooth jazz gig one time when i was on a break from touring with maynard in between tours and I went and met Keith and heard him and the, the, the whole gig I remember thinking like 
the jazz gig, he kind of cut loose all of a sudden. Um, my my connection's being spotty. I, I apologize. You got me? That's all right. All right. Yep, you're back. You're just talking Can about when he's cutting loose. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I thought Keith was like, I didn't. I wasn't blown away by this smooth jazz gig until the last tune. He just, in one tune, changed that outlook completely. He started playing all this kind of like overlapping, funky stuff that he plays. And I was just like, who in the heck is this dude? I had never heard anybody play like that before. He had a new, kind of a new slant on groove drumming that I hadn't heard before. When I would ask him about it, he would say, he would mainly cite Zig from the meters, but it, it sounded like Zig, but like a, the way he kind of overlapped this phrasing. It wasn't just linear playing like a lot of the fusion guys before that. He had this way of overlapping bass drum phrases and snare drum phrases and ride cymbal and left foot stuff that just knocked me out. And, um, and he, and when I finally got to see him play with Krantz live, he had that kind of big giant open bass drum sound, which just was like, wow, who's doing that? You know? <laughs> and, um, really funky, really funky drummer, really great groove player. I've got to go. He's been nice enough to, to, you know, give me tickets when he comes through, through town to see him with Sting and Steely Dan. And, um, you know, I keep up with him periodically, but he's, he's an amazing drummer and just, um, really unique has a really unique style, especially playing this instrumental music, you know, like mm -hmm. with, with Wayne, like there's, um, he doesn't sound like anybody else. And that's, that's hard to do hard to have mm -hmm. an original, original voice. You know? Yeah, you can. I can usually tell someone's impact by how many people start sounding like them. You know, and there was yeah. a lot of Keith disciples. <laughs> For sure, man. He, he's he's something else, man. He's really really is a great great creative player. You know, and I hope I get to hear him do more music like that. You know, he's he's kind of blew up in the drum world and sort of getting all these big pop gigs, which he sounds great on. But I I, I love hearing him. I love hearing his mind. It, I mean, not that his mind is not at work playing grooves but like i love hearing what he comes up with on that record particularly like there's some stuff with the snares off like he just it's like and i don't mean just the stuff that everybody copies like or tries to with the rims and this and just these kind of muted stuff with the hand but just like single notes on a snare drum with the snare turned off it's like he found a new way to to play with that somehow and it's just really really amazing you know, and he's a, nice, a super nice guy. You know, mm -hmm. it's nice when you when you meet players and they're and they're uh, warm and inviting. I've I've had some bad bad run-ins with some other guys. You know, <laughs> who will remain nameless? Who will I remain will, nameless? I will not comment. So let's go to your last record. <laughs> My last one um, is uh, this great drummer Ralph Peterson. This is a, a record of his called the Reclamation Project which came out um, in the 90s, 95, I think. And this was his band called The Fotet. He put out a lot of quintet records with kind of traditional quintet instrumentation, you know, saxophone and trumpet up front and piano trio. This band has vibes um, on this record, soprano saxophone exclusively. Uh, previous to this record, the band had clarinet. Um, this one has soprano saxophone uh, played by the great Steve Wilson vibes and acoustic bass and drums. So I like the instrumentation. It's kind of different. Um, Ralph's writing to me is really unique. Um, I love the sound of this record. It's kind of like I was saying about the Brantford record. It's, it's kind of raw and real sounding. It just sounds like, um, like you're standing in the room kind of nothing really special about the recording, but it's, it has this realness that always, always knocks me out. Um, and I know some, a lot of my jazz friends, you know, some people, some people don't love Ralph's playing. I, I've always really loved Ralph's playing. I think it's really swinging, um, really adventurous, kind of fiery and busy at times. Maybe people don't like how aggressive he is um, at times. Um, I, I'm really thankful. I, Ralph passed away recently. Um, he had after, after a long battle with some illness and, um, I got to finally see him maybe five or six years ago live and it, he just floored me. Like 
I knew I would love it in person, but it, it was just so swinging and to watch him lead a band and shout out commands to musicians on stage and his personality seemed larger than life and his playing was kind of larger than life. And, um, you know, it can be a little, um, over the top at times, maybe mm -hmm. in some ways, but I, I always loved that about it, you know? And, um, I think of all his records, this one is the one that always hit me the hardest. Um, I just like the instrumentation so much. Um, I don't know what else to say about it, man. He's just a great, great drummer, amazing musician, you know? I feel like he was one that didn't translate to record as well when you go to see him live. Like it, the experience of seeing Ralph play for me was so like overwhelming. And yeah. I mean, he um, sounds great on record, but I think I don't get it as much from his records. Yeah. I only saw him once live. So it's hard mm -hmm. for me to, you know, where someone else I've, you know, I've seen Bill Stewart maybe 15 times live. So I can, I have an idea of seeing him in different rooms, different drums, different mm -hmm. eyes of rooms. Ralph, I only saw him live once. Um, so it's hard for me to say the feeling I got from it. This was a big outdoor thing on a big stage, mm -hmm. but it still felt really amazing. Um, you know, he might not be on as many records also as a sideman as maybe some of his peers, you know, maybe Tane or Bill or um, Blade or some of these guys are, are on more records as a sideman possibly. But, but thankfully, like Ralph has so many records as a leader, there's still a huge recorded output. You know, mm -hmm. and um, he's really unique, man. He takes so many chances. There's a lot of risk involved on the records. I like how on safe on this record specifically, he's going for it, man. Like he's not afraid for it to fall apart. And it's, <laughs> you know, that's not always the best way maybe to approach every gig, but um, it's his band, it's his writing and it's his spirit. And it, and, you know, he came out of Blakey and, you got to play double drums with art. I'm sure he's trying to, 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 to do all the things that all his heroes did. Just like, just like I'm trying to play like my heroes and try to on, in some way continue that, you know, I mean, that sounds corny, but, but just to, just to keep being um, like you asked earlier about creating bands, trying to find situations that you want to play in and mm -hmm. that you're exciting excited about playing in that's really important you know and it's a reason i don't you know i've been able to i've been fortunate enough to say no to you know society gigs and wedding gigs and stuff like that um i'm not saying i've never done any but i, I very rarely do stuff like that i try to to do as many as much creative playing as i can and it's based off of guys like ralph peterson and Mm -hmm. Jeff Watts and Elvin and Tony and Jack having bands and leading bands and so many more. Um, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out. There's just so many masters and, and great creative musicians, you know. So what is next for you? Do you have other projects in the works or are you just kind of getting these bands in the flow? I've, What's I've next? I've been toying with this idea of uh, about a year ago, I was sold on it and I was sure I was going to see it through. And now I've kind of, I get hot and cold on stuff. I'll start it and then I'll get, I'll get, I'll lose my focus. But I was thinking about making a solo drumming record, which nobody really needs that to hear that probably. But in some way, there's something about it that made me feel like I was maybe ready to try to tackle it. Um, so maybe I'll try to do that. Um, I'd like to maybe make a recording with, with that band Throckmorton plot, um, which would be like live instrument, you know, instrumental music, and then maybe going on the back end and adding some things to it in a production style, maybe inspired mm. a little bit by, by hip hop or, or DJ shadow who I talked about, not specifically, but just that style of music. Um, Thoth trio has been talking about making a new record. We have probably, I don't know, 30 or 30 or so tunes that, we haven't recorded. Um, I have some touring coming up this year with, with Dan Wilson from DTC organ trio. We're going to be doing some touring as a quartet, but I, I'm hoping we get a, a trio record of that group out soon of the organ trio. That's a great, great band to play in. Um, I don't know what else, man, just trying to figure out how to play these things, man, trying to, <laughs> trying to figure out. And, and also just playing live with the other groups I talked about earlier. I love to make a record with, 
with um, Fourth River as well, um, and maybe even the quartet at some at some point. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot more we can follow up with. We'll have, to have a part two. We're getting getting to the 90 yeah, minute man. mark. So, <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Too long. I had so many follow up questions, but no, we're going to cut it there. Thanks for yeah. I get long. I, I start talking. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to stop. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a, it's been a it's been a blast. Yeah, for it's fun. Sure. To, it's fun I'm... to geek out, man. It's fun to geek out on. On, on this stuff, you know. Yeah, we'll do a lot more of it. I might create a playlist of all of your um, your records so we can share it. There's oh wow, that would be amazing. I don't think we'll find that Schofield record, but all the, all the rest of them hopefully are yeah. <laughs> exist somewhere. You'll find it somewhere, man. It's probably online somewhere, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, I threw the CD away when I moved like a dummy. What, why would you do that, man? <laughs> I don't I'm have still a CD buying CDs. I'm still buying CDs, man. That's my that's the that's the kind of platform. Like the uh, that's how I got really. I used to have cassettes and I got really into CDs and I just kind of, I haven't given up on them yet. You know, <laughs> nobody buys them if you make them, but I buy them. If you make them, I'll buy them. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. That's it for this week's episode. Hope you enjoyed my chat with David. If you did, please head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and drop a five-star rating and maybe type out a review that'll help spread the word to more drummers around the world. Also, if you're only checking this out in the audio format, Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel because we post every one of these shows in the video form over there. Till next week, go practice, listen to some of these records. We'll see you then.